From WBNG, your weather authority, this is 12 News at 5. But I think that justice has been served to the best that it could have been. He does not deserve to be in this modern society among us. Parents and mother, I don't, there's nothing I can say. I never remember meant to hurt your little girl. I'm so sorry. Today, three sentencings and three different death cases. The first, Orlando Tessero, the man found guilty of killing fellow Binghamton University nursing student Haley Anderson. The second, Wilfredo Picatora, is found guilty in the attack and fire that left 61-year-old Victor Benayan dead and a woman badly beaten. And the third, Michael Jinsarowski, the man who pleaded guilty and was convicted after police say he drove drunk and hit and killed 16-year-old Connie Mazaris. Good evening, I'm Chloe Vincenti. And I'm Paul Mueller. We begin tonight with the case for Orlando to Sarah. The former Binghamton University student is sentenced to 30 years in Nicaraguan prison after a judge found him guilty of killing Haley Anderson. A quick moving case after months of holdup in Nicaragua as the country dealt with political unrest. As court proceedings come to an end, the Broome County District Attorney and Haley's parents tell me it's the sentence they hoped for. Orlando Tercero has been sentenced to 30 years. The maximum sentence. That's what Orlando Tercero faces in Nicaraguan prison after he was found guilty for killing Binghamton University student Haley Anderson. The fact of the matter is. District Attorney Steve Cornwell. Orlando Tercero. Facilitating the proceedings. In a cold-blooded manner. Till the very end. Choked a life out of a young woman who was, we believe, probably sleeping. It doesn't get any more sick and depraved than that. It was a first of its kind case for Cornwell and Broome County. We put our trust in the prosecutors over there. Um, we put our trust in you know people we've never met. For Haley's parents, they're relieved as the proceedings come to an end. Can't really put a number on somebody's life, but I think that justice has been served to the best that it could have been. Tercero's attorney still has the chance to appeal that would take place under a different court process. Now to another sentencing in a high-profile murder case. Wilfredo Picatorres faces 70 years to life in prison for murder, attempted murder, and arson. And Sparacco joining us from the newsroom tonight with details from inside the courtroom today. Anne? Wilfredo Pica Torres was found guilty for murdering 61-year-old Victor Benayan and beating 27-year-old Heather Stroop, along with setting the home on fire. Pica Torres silent throughout the sentencing today, not saying a word when the judge allowed for any final comment. However, Stroop and the family of Victor Benayan anything but silent. When Pica Torres entered the courtroom, the people sitting before him yelling and crying. The family of Benayan saying they will never be able to forgive the man responsible for the murder. Honorable Judge Kevin Dooley saying he's never dealt, hardly dealt with the cases like this in the past. This, uh, this is another case, very disturbing, uh, one of the worst I've seen in nearly 40 years working in the criminal justice system in this county. Now, the sentencing follows multiple trial dates that involve dramatic testimonies from Stroop, among others. Tonight at 6, we'll hear from the daughter of the victim and her final words to her father's convicted killer. And thank you. We turn now to the third case. Michael Jinsarowski, the Port Crane man, sentenced to 5 to 15 years behind bars. Jinsarowski, as you might recall, convicted of driving drunk in a crash that killed 16-year-old Connie Mazaris, the Oigo teen riding her bike down Route 369 in the town of Fenton. Jin Zorowski pleading guilty back in December to vehicular manslaughter and aggravated DWI. Connie's mother speaking in court today. For a three-year-old nephew, you asked, you know, when's Connie coming back from heaven? I want to see her. I miss her. The judge also revoking Jin Zorowski's driver's license. A lot going on today, and Damon, it doesn't stop with the weather, it's getting even colder. Yeah, once again, we had a little bit of a warm-up today, a little bit of a break, you could say, from what we had all week long, but uh, yeah, colder weather, it's back for us here tonight. There's that colder nudge of air that still is settled in over the eastern part of the country. Our friends back off to the west, back up into the 60s and 50s, definitely enjoying that out that direction. But again, today we got up into the 40s, that felt like a warm-up here, and as we get further into the evening, you see the clouds that are gradually starting to drop to the south and east. Even a few flakes popping up in northern Cortland and Shenango counties. That is that cold front that is slowly dropping down into the Twin Tiers. Seeing that one person fall is going to be hard to forget and I'm going to have to 
live with that sight in my head. Turning now to the California school shooting. One day later, police there are trying to figure out why a 16-year-old student brought a gun to school and opened fire on his classmates. In the end, two students would die, three others were hurt. But the question everyone is asking, why? Why would the student go on a shooting rampage and then turn the gun on himself on his birthday? Marin Austin has the latest from Santa Clarita, California. Investigators estimate it took suspected shooter Nathan Burhow just seconds to pull a semi-automatic handgun from his backpack and open fire, killing two classmates and wounding three others before turning the gun on himself. We did not find any manifesto, any diary that spelled it out, any suicide note or any writings which will clearly identify his motive behind this assault. Authorities say 16-year-old Gracie Ann Molberger was killed. They have not released the identity of the 14-year-old boy who died. And the gun control advocacy group Every Town saying the Saugus High School shooting is the 85th incident of gun violence at a school this year alone. Tonight, the community saying goodbye to a local teen who may have lost her battle with cancer but certainly left a lasting legacy. That's right. 15-year-old Maddie Shaw passed away Sunday after her long battle with childhood cancer. She dedicated her life to spreading awareness and helping others. She did. And tonight, 12 News reporter Tyler Brown live in Binghamton with how family and friends are remembering her. Tyler? That's right, Paul and Chloe. It might be a little harder to see because it's getting darker outside, but take a look right behind me. You can see this huge line of people, and it's stretching all ac around the church. Everyone is here at St. Thomas Church in Binghamton for calling hours, all to say goodbye to a young girl who inspired so many people. Maddie Shaw was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma in 2013, which is a rare type of cancer that occurs in and around the bones. And throughout all the surgeries and the treatments, Shaw and her family have been huge advocates in the Southern Tier, spreading awareness and raising money to help children battling cancer. Maddie has had such a wonderful impact on the whole community. Um, brave girl, gone through a lot. Everybody has been pulling for her, praying for her, um, and it's just affected the entire area. And people here are wearing yellow or gold in honor of childhood cancer awareness. And also they're wearing the color teal, which is in honor of Maddie. It was her favorite color. Calling hours in tonight at 6. But coming up on 12 News at 530, why many are saying Maddie will never be forgotten in this community. Live in Binghamton, Tyler Brown, 12 News. Next at 5, the Salvation Army now taking its red kettle donations. It's that time of year, but this year they're also taking donations in a different way. We're going to explain that. And as we're approaching the holidays, we're catching up with Meals on Wheels, who are looking for volunteers. But first, a live look right now across Johnson City. No sherbet tonight, no, Chloe. No, maybe a little, the, what's that green thing down there? Fluorescent <laughs> yellow, maybe? <laughs> Damon's going to have your full forecast right here on 12 News when your weather authority returns. I really don't like seeing people go without anything, so it makes me feel good that I can do something for them in return. Tonight, the red kettles of the Salvation Army are back for the Christmas season, but this time with a twist. Yeah, this year the Salvation Army is introducing a new way to give back. For those of you who may not necessarily carry cash in your wallet, the Salvation Army has a high-tech solution just for you. And that's very fine. 12 News reporter Katie Jones ringing the bell in Vestal. Hey, Katie. Hey guys, we're out here collecting donations and the Salvation Army is actually going to make it easier for you to donate this Christmas. They're introducing Kettle Pay, which requires a simple tap on your phone. You might know this sound. A sign that the season of giving has arrived. Red kettles popping up all throughout the southern tier so that you can help those in need. This is the, the biggest fundraiser across America. And maybe you've passed a kettle, but with no cash on hand, you weren't able to donate. But now, that's all changing. Basically, all you have to do is pull up your, your Google Pay or Apple Pay and scan the little disk, and it'll take you straight to the donation site. It's really that simple. Kettle Pay makes it easier to donate on the go. The money collected at the kettle helps us throughout the year. A lot of people think it's for Christmas only, but it's not. This is up to 20% of my budget, and we really just need the funds to sustain our programs throughout the entire year. Funds going back to help others in our community. 
I really don't like seeing people go without anything, so it makes me feel good that I can do something for them in return. Whether it's a few bucks out of your wallet or a quick tap on your phone, the Salvation Army says you're making a difference. If you have the means to give, just drop a few few cents into the bucket. Everything counts. Every drop in the bucket goes towards uh, our funding and for our, our services and programs. And you have until December 24th to donate. You can stop at locations like right here at the Weiss Market in Vestal. But for more locations on where to find those red kettles, just head over to our website. That's WBNG.com. So for now, live in Vestal, Katie Jones, 12 News. So now there's no excuse. Yes, Even if you don't have right. cash. All right. Well, it's not just local charities that are helping the less fortunate this holiday season. Meals on Wheels is a year-round program delivering both meals and human connection. 12 News reporter Josh Rosenblatt live in studio tonight with why they say it's their busiest time of year. Josh? Well, if you guess this time of year is the busiest because of Thanksgiving and the winter holidays, you wouldn't be wrong. But there's another reason that plays an even bigger role in the need for volunteers. Meals on Wheels is a nationwide program that delivers hot meals to people who struggle cooking the food themselves. Locally, Broome County's program is run almost entirely by volunteers who deliver the food over 56 routes throughout the community five days a week. Many of the program's volunteers have been participating for years, saying it's a rewarding experience. However, when the weather gets colder, the need for volunteers gets greater. We always are looking for volunteers, especially this time of year when the weather gets colder. We do have volunteers that go away for the winter, so especially this time of year, the need for volunteers is very great. Even though the program is run by the Broome County Office for Aging, staff say there's no age requirement to qualify for the program and that it's completely based off your ability to cook for yourself. Now coming up on 12 News at 6, hear from volunteers themselves who say doing a good thing is great, but the rewards they feel themselves are even better. Josh, thank you. And so many people rely on those yes. meals each and every day. And they day. said as the weather gets colder, Damon, you said earlier the weather is getting colder, so they definitely need some volunteers. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's been cold all week. We kind of break today. But, yeah, it's going to get colder here once again tonight. So good on them and all of the work they do there. But, yeah, if you were out and about today, it may have felt slightly warmer. That's thanks to that sunshine we had out there. And, uh, well, a little bit of a sunset you can see just beyond the clouds there here as we wrap up this Friday. 34 degrees, a little bit windy as well. Well, at least up at the higher elevations of the airport. There's those temperatures, mostly middle to upper 30s, still a few lower 40s out there. Appalachian, of course, one of those spots right there. But we're all going to start to cool down as we get further into the night as that weak cold front continues to drop to the south. Again, it's not much of a divide, but still 40s near the coast, down to near freezing here in the Twin Tiers. And you see the darker blues and purples in the far upper part of the map. Yeah, that's some of that cold air that once again is going to be returning later on tonight. There's a coastal low down near the Carolinas bringing plenty of rainfall. This is something we'll keep an eye on over the next couple of days. But again, overall, the weather is fairly quiet across the Twin Tiers. You can clearly see where that cold front is right now across portions of northern New York back into Vermont and New Hampshire. Again, that is slowly dropping south. Most of the precipitation is going to stay to our north, but we can't rule out a few flurries out there in spots. And a matter of fact, we have a few of those right now in northern Shenango County, including Norwich there as we get further on into this evening. So yes, once that front passes, it will drop down, get fairly cold once again here tonight. And that's how we're going to start out our weekend. But overall, pretty quiet one indeed. Not a bad weekend to enjoy some time off at all there. And again, we are watching that coastal low that's to our south for Monday. It could bring some mixed precipitation, all depending on where that track of that low goes. And then we're going to actually keep temperatures fairly seasonal as we get into next week. Looking like a pretty good weekend. Oh, yeah. A lot of sunshine. And I, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you and I'm like, what's different today? And Chloe's like, you haven't seen him in a while. The beard. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's been a little warm this, uh, this weekend. It's been helping out a little bit. <laughs> no, for sure. no, keep you warm. Thanks, Damon. <laughs> well, it's state playoff time on the gridiron. The goal is going to bring us the action from Vestal as the Tioga kicks off the weekend of state playoffs. That's next. This is 12 Sports. 
How's it going, everyone? I'm coming your way live from Vestal High School as we have the Class D State quarterfinal going on right now. Tioga and Frankfurt Skyler. And something that I have certainly never seen happen this football season, the lights actually went off a short time ago here at Vestal High School. Both teams had to go into the locker room, a delay of game, about 10 minutes, but the team's just coming back onto the field as the lights have returned. So before I give you an update on this game, let's take a look at how Tioga got to this point. The team is looking to get back to a place that they've been to many times before. They have the advantage over the opponent, their opponent in the fact that they have been in this position seven of the eight last seasons, making it to the state semifinals. Their opponent, however, won their first Section 3 championship since the state tournament began in 1993, just last week. Now, of course, as we know, Tioga went undefeated this season, cruising on top of Class D. And Walton giving Tioga a bit of a close call in the Class D finals last week, falling just eight points short. But as we always see from this Tigers team, you got Brady Worthing, Emmett Wood leading the pack to a Class D title once again. Six touchdowns, nearly 450 yards between the two in that game. So what have they been doing tonight? Well, we've only seen two drives so far. Current score is 6-0 Tioga. We have nine minutes left in the first quarter on Tioga's first drive. They scored a touchdown and then forced Frankfurt Skyler to punt. We, of course, will have highlights of this one later tonight in 12 sports at 11. But, hey, we have a lot of state playoff action this weekend, not just on the football field. We're going to take a look at that right now. It's a busy week for Section 4. After tonight's Class D game, we have Union Endicott hosting Carthage. I'll give you a preview of that one coming up in 12 sports at 6 o'clock. Then tomorrow we have both the main Endwo and Vestal field hockey teams up in Buffalo competing in states. The Spartans looking for their fifth state title in Vestal in search of their very first. We have the Unit Eagle girls soccer team making their first appearance in semifinals. That comes up at 10 a.m. tomorrow at SUNY Cortland. And then our Saturday football action here at Vestal High School. Susquehanna Valley taking on Lowville at noon and Shenango Forks taking on Salve at 3 o'clock. As I said, guys, the lights are back on. The teams are warming back up on the field. Currently 6-0 Tioga in the first quarter. I will have highlights of this coming up tonight in 12 sports at 11. And we will have the Union Endicott game. That probably will have a bit of a later start tonight now. It was supposed to start at 8, but I will have highlights of that as well tonight in 12 sports at 11. For now, live in Vestal, Nicole Menner, 12 sports. I thought with that magnetic personality, <laughs> she had zapped the lights, but all of a sudden yeah. they're back. Friday night lights, there playoff you go. style. All right. Next on 12 News at 5.30, calling hours for one local girl mm. gone too soon. Yeah, we're hearing from those who know her and her family. But first, a live look at downtown Binghamton from the Security Mutual Building. We'll be checking back in with Howard in just a few minutes. We're here with 12 News, your weather authority.